Hey there, fellow guitar slingers. It's been a little while. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, welcome to the live stream today. Uh, everyone that's here tuned in, please uh, just let me know your name if you can and uh, where you're at right now. That'll be awesome. And where, uh, what type of guitar you're playing? So, as you may have may have guessed, uh, the reason that I'm doing this live stream is because I bought a new guitar. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, which is just type in NB and guitar for either of those platforms and you'll be able to follow, uh, you'll know that I've posted up some pictures of this beast uh, on the platforms. Uh, yeah, so that's how some people keep in contact with me. Um, they follow me on social media, NB and guitar. I might just move back a bit, a bit easier to see the guitar. Yeah, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, make sure you type your name in and everything because uh, it's really good for me just to see where uh, everyone's at. Let me know what pieces you're working on. Let me know what your guitar is. And uh, yeah, so it's probably a little bit early to talk about it, but I, I may talk about this guitar several times through the live stream. Uh, this is a Cordoba C12 uh, spruce top. Indian rosewood back inside. It's got a beautiful feature um, at the back there and underneath. And uh, apparently it has a lattice bracing for the soundboard. So if you're unfamiliar with what a lattice brace is for the soundboard, you can jump onto my website and just uh, do a search for lattice brace. Soundtop, I think the lattice brace was pioneered by Greg Smallman who's uh, one of the world's most famous classical guitar luthiers based out of Australia. But any one of, anyone that follows John Williams and has seen the Seville concert, which is uh, kind of a documentary that was made about John Williams back in the 90s, you will be familiar with Greg Smallman. Uh, a lot of prominent players play his instruments, John Williams, of course, being the most notable and uh, another famous person, Shwefe Young, and um, John Couch from Australia. Uh, he's actually a New Zealander, but he plays a smallman. I had the pleasure of hearing that smallman uh, in concert or about two years ago when the New Zealand Classical Guitar Quartet were doing a nationwide tour here in New Zealand. And uh, I kind of know John through social media and uh, that guitar Wow, it was easily the best sounding guitar uh, in the quartet. Um, yeah, so it, this guitar has that bracing that Greg Smallman developed. Uh, if anyone has any more information on lattice bracing that, that I'm maybe missing, please let me know. But anyway, it's a series of, it looks like a, a, a lattice work, kind of like this, and it's under here. And... Uh, Apparently, it allows uh, just a more even distribution of the sound as opposed to maybe the traditional fan bracing, uh, the likes of Tories and Hauser guitars uh, had. So in that sense, it's fairly modern, um, modern feature or modern construction design method that's used by some makers today. Uh, this guitar also has a slightly raised fretboard, as you can see. If you're not sure what the raised fretboard is for, the raised fretboard facilitates a bit easier access to the um, upper frets here. Uh, in my mind, it's not quite high enough. If you're, I think if you're going to make a raised fretboard, you should have a raised fretboard that's really quite high, probably a centimeter or more at least. And then it really, really makes a difference. At the moment, uh, 
this doesn't really make any difference. It's, it's still not enough to really get the thumb under there. I'm just going to check some of the comments that are rolling in. Hadi, Hadi, how's it going, man? I'm glad that my uh, Amelie uh, tutorial was able to help you. I didn't even really know much about that uh, piece until someone suggested I should learn it, and then I thought, wow, this is nice. Uh, Jan Tiersen, I think, was the composer for that, and he's a gifted composer. I'm glad it helped you. Have, can you play the whole thing? Oh, yeah, and you've got a Cordoba as well. Oh, yeah, obviously, this is a gathering place for people of taste. Uh, the cutaway, a bit like my Takamine. That one's got the cutaway. Uh, my Takamine that uh, everyone that's subscribed to this channel have seen one of my classical guitar videos is familiar with that Takamine. It was a cutaway as well, TH5C. I've still got it. Uh, but it's sort of in the case gathering dust at the moment. Yeah, as soon as I got this one, that was it. I hope I'm pronouncing your names correctly. Sunya Panda. Oh, you're from India. Cool, man. Up kisa hai. Kia hao, hi. I worked with heaps of people from India when I was uh, living in uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Oman, Bahrain. That lots of uh, actually the hotel chain that I was performing in called the Rami Hotel was owned by uh, a family from India. They own heaps of hotels all over the Middle East. Richard, you're playing a Kato MCG 110C. Man, I don't even know what that brand is, man. Tell me a bit more about it. Kato. I have never come across that before. 110C. Working on JS Bark. Nice. That's why I was playing a little bit of that at the beginning. Hey, g'day, Ian. Thailand. Cool. I've been to Thailand, had a great time there, spent a few days in uh, Bangkok. One of my friends was actually, he was teaching music at the at an international school there. He's from New Zealand, an amazing classical pianist. Uh, yeah, so he was teaching music uh, at an international school in Bangkok. So my wife and I stayed with him for a couple of days. And then we cruised out to the, uh, uh, where? to Cambodia. Yeah, we, we went to Siem Reap, saw the uh, the temples there. Yeah, it was awesome. Felicitaciones. It, indeed, this is a Cordoba C12. And I got an amazing deal on it. So I think in New Zealand dollars, these are meant to retail for about... 3,500 New Zealand dollars, which in American dollars is about 2,500 US. But I ended up scoring this brand new for uh, 1,200, 1,200 US dollars. Uh, the Rock Shop, which is a uh, quite a, a, a well-known music retailer here in New Zealand, uh, purchased this guitar and uh, for whatever reason they made some type of mistake or something anyway to cut a long story short the guy that was in control of bringing this in for the rock shop needed to get rid of it and he told um, the luthier that I use uh, the luthier I use here in New Zealand is Ramsey Phillips uh, he told Ramsey about it, and I just happened to be at Ramsey's place uh, asking him to do some work on my Takamine. And I told him I was in the market for a classical guitar. I was actually planning to get something uh, way more expensive than this, actually, but it was the deal was just too good to pass up, so I got it. Yeah, at probably, I don't know, two-thirds of the price, maybe even less, half between... 
excuse me, about three fifths of the price, something like that. All solid body mahogany back and sides. Cedar face mahogany back and sides. Dude, how does that sound? Handmade in China, beautiful guitars. Mm, I'm going to have a look at that. Yeah, definitely. Actually, I think these are made in China too. Um, for those of you that don't know, I spent ages in China. Uh, I lived in Shenzhen for a year and a half. I was performing at the Sheko Nanhai Hilton Hotel for one and a half years. Had an amazing time out there. A great contract, beautiful hotel, and we were treated really nicely. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I've got nothing against guitars made in China, that's for sure. As long as they're not, you know, the, the rip-off ones. Uh, yeah, some really nice stuff coming out there. I think the most top-end guitars out of there are the Yulong Guo guitars. Uh, yeah, by all accounts, those are pretty amazing too. Oh, did you win? Dude, I don't think so, because you're a, a somebody commented on this um when I when I said I was going live. So on the post, yeah, someone um someone wrote down what it was. It was a C12. Um yeah, I think it could be in the comments. I'm not sure. But you know what, man? You are the first person, so I would suggest that you follow me on um, either Instagram or Facebook. I'm talking to you, Keith, by the way. Uh, follow me on uh, MBN Guitar. So, yeah, MBN Guitar. I think there's a little icon on my channel for Facebook or Instagram. And uh, chuck me a message on there, man. Tell me who you are, and then we'll we'll jack up something for Skype. All good? <laughs> So the playability on this guitar, I think, for the money, just absolutely amazing value. Uh, it's super easy to play. And a lovely tone. Excellent sustain, I must say. It's actually, the, uh, for me, it's, this is the easiest classical guitar I've ever played. In all honesty, I didn't know classical guitars could be this easy to play. Uh, by the way, if you've just, just joined, please uh, write your name down, where you're from, and what guitar you're playing. Remembering that uh, this video is mainly about uh, this guitar and uh, me wanting to hear about the guitars you're playing. Thoughts if you've had any experience with Cordoba? Thank you. 
So for those of you that don't know what that piece was, that's serious, but I assume if you're here, you know exactly what that piece is. It's one of the standards of the classical guitar repertoire. A, trans, a transcription of the piano piece, actually, by Isaac Albeneth. Hey, Keith. Oh, Arizona. Nice. Must be hot there right now, eh? Oh, your mum's from New Zealand, bro. What? Where? Oh, you found... Oh, that's how you found my channel. You play a bunch of guitars. You've had two Cordovas, a C9 and a C5. Excellent, man. Well, like I said, if you're still here, I I, I don't know. You know, I can't see who's watching. Uh, but yeah, flick me a message on Facebook or Instagram uh, to NBN Guitar, and uh, I'll reply to you. We'll get that Skype lesson sorted. Jason, cool man, welcome. Dude, you pretty much gave me my foundation in finger picking when I was deployed in the Middle East with your lesson on Beethoven. Oh, wicked man. Oh, that's awesome. Whereabouts in the Middle East were you? I've lived out there. Uh, I've lived in Dubai, Bahrain, uh, Oman, and uh, Abu Dhabi. Yeah, probably spent three years of my life, or maybe four, actually, in the Middle East. <clears throat> I guess by the use of the word deployed, uh, you're in the forces. Good old Beethoven, eh? So which which one? Was it Moonlight Sonata? Was that the one you were playing uh, that you learned from me, or was it the um, Adagio Cantabile, that one? Um, 
Beautiful piece, too. I can't even remember it. Mm. Been too long, rusty. But I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you learned something from my videos. It's cool. Probably a, a nice distraction too. I would imagine if you're deployed out in the Middle East. Oh, Qatar. <clears throat> you know what? I've only ever passed through Qatar, uh, just through the airport. Amazing airport too, I must say. El Noir de la Mar. Ah, yeah, nice piece, eh? Awesome. <clears throat> so you guys letting me know. Uh, yeah, remember, if you're just, just checking out the channel just now or just joining the live stream, let me know your name, where you're from, the guitar you're playing. And, yeah, while we're at it, uh, what you've learned from me or my videos down through the years. Uh, of course, I should extend an apology uh, to those of you that have been uh, you know, with me for ages. For some people have been subscribed to me for years. You know, I was, uh, I was uploading all the time, probably between 2016 and 2020, and then uh, another business that I developed uh, in addition to teaching guitar just sort of ended up taking up all my time. And that's why for two years you haven't, you've hardly seen me. Um, yeah, it's a bummer because I really want to get back to teaching. Uh, I love it actually, uh, interacting with everybody and you know sharing what little I know about guitar and, and playing. And uh, yeah, hopefully helping guys like Jason, you know, that have learned something from me and it's helped them get through um, maybe a difficult time when you're out deployed or you know whatever. Music's got that that ability to just help you through the tough times. You know, you might be feeling down or whatever, and you just grab that guitar and it just transports you to somewhere, uh, usually somewhere nice, you know. Yeah, nothing like music, I think. Hey, g'day, Chris. Austin, are you from Austin, Texas? Ah, oh, yes, I see. Austin City Limits. And then you got all the guitars there, musical instruments, and then Texas. Nice. C10, 7, 8, Parla Dulce. Those are the smaller guitars, eh? 7, 8, that's the size, eh? So what scale length would that be, man? Is that like 630 mil? 630, oh, you're from Texas, eh, bro? You fellas only use inches. Nah, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <clears throat> it's all metric over here, man. I'm assuming it's 630 mils, uh, millimeters, I should say. Oh, yep, 630. Sweet. I was right on the money. Good thing I didn't get that wrong, eh? I might have got cancelled. Julio, Chile. Bro, welcome. I, I used to perform uh, in a band for about a year with a guy from Chile. Carlos. <laughs> I just started learning this this morning. It's a, uh, uh, what is it? Allegro Brillante, I think, by Matteo Carcassi. Good stuff. I've got his whole book um, on etudes. I think there's 25 of them in there, something like that. Yeah, mean piece. It's cool. 630 mil millimeters, Chris. That must be pretty easy to play, eh? Uh, how's the projection? How's the volume? I haven't played a guitar that small, uh, but I hear they're really comfortable, especially if you've got sort of smaller fingers or whatever. Oh, you're 66. Just a young buck, eh? Thank you. 
Hope you guys are all good. All good. Um, Soundport projects sound at you also in cedar. Oh, and the cedar aroma is in your face. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so the uh, the guitar you've got has got a sound port. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to try that. Eh? I've heard it, really good things about it. Like you can really monitor your playing a lot more effectively with the. Uh, a little sound hole eh, if you have one there i think some guitars have got two right they got one in the the up about and one on the lower oh hill uh, do you mean a kenny hill guitar chris oh who's got a yamaha juan hey man i know your name blankenvort that's not a name that i forget you know Doctor, aren't you? Juan. <clears throat> oh, oh, you made your own sound port, Chris, with a 40 mil drill bit. Man. Respect. Hey, Michael, North Carolina, USA, Cordoba C5. Man, you know, I can't believe how many of you play Cordoba guitars. It's just blowing me away. I thought I was special. Did he, Chris? Kenny Hill developed the Cordoba Master Series line. Wow, see, this is why these live streams and that are so cool, because I, I get to learn stuff. You know, you might be tuning in thinking you're going to learn something from me. Oh, you might, but uh, I just like this interaction. You know, it's cool. If I because when I upload a, an instructional video or whatever, there's not really much live stuff, live interaction. You know, you guys might watch it and then some people might comment on it and then I'll go back and read it. But it's not real time like this. You know, people are tuned in and we can talk. It's really nice, especially after all this COVID business we've been through. Things seem to be settling down here in New Zealand as far as COVID is concerned, which is nice. Thanks, Juan. Man, am I, is my memory serving me correctly? Your profile picture is of a doctor? You're a doctor, eh? Streets of Rage. Man, that game, I love that game. 
back in the day, the two dudes cruising down the street and you could pick up the baseball bats eh, and all of that sort of stuff, side-scrolling. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree, Chris. I think, you know, I I paid 1,800 New Zealand dollars for this, and it's just blown me away, man. Uh, to be honest, I've never really had a, a really good classical guitar. Uh, I mean, the, don't get me wrong, the Takamina TH5C is a, is a great guitar. Obviously, it's not like a purist guitar because it's a cutaway. But it's not high end either. Uh, not in classical guitar terms, it's not. I mean, I don't think you're well, from in dollar terms anyway. You're probably not getting really high end until you're spending sort of four, five thousand US dollars and up. Uh, yeah, so I've never actually spent anywhere near that amount of money on a guitar in my life. Uh, the most expensive guitar I've ever bought is behind me it's one of these electrics so yeah this is the most expensive guitar i've ever bought for myself it was uh, about three thousand us dollars it's a uh, ibanez j custom uh seven string it's a beast um but you know what sadly the the all my electric guitars just gather dust When I was uh, when I was playing in bands professionally, I was playing a lot of electric guitar. Um, I had to, and uh, but since I've come home, I hardly play. I get way more satisfaction out of playing classical guitar than I do electric. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what about you guys? Anyone out there playing electric guitars as well? I think most guitarists do. You know, even hardcore classical guitarists uh, have probably got an electric guitar lying around somewhere. Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, that's Mean Streets of Rage. Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm glad you like my channel. Crem you know, Cremona. Here's a story. Cremona guitars based out of Eastern Europe, right? They reached out to me probably three years ago, maybe a little bit more. I can't remember offhand. And they offered me a signature guitar. Like, I mean... I could have my name on a guitar, you know, like the Josh Rogers signature Cremona guitar. Far was blown away. And I was keen, you know, I was like, of course. I mean, what guitarist doesn't want like a signature guitar in their own name? But it just fell over. I don't know what happened. They were keen, 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 and then nothing. I just didn't hear from them again. So, um, yeah, that was kind of sad. Uh, but you know, it is how it, it is what it is. They probably had some executive business decision and decided to sponsor someone with hair, maybe. Yeah, that's what I reckon it was. <clears throat> but anyway, I got this. So, yes, this is a C12 Cordova C12. I think it's the top of the line Cordova before you start getting into the is it artist series or something like that. Uh, when they've got actual names for the guitars, not just a, a number like C12 or C, C10 or C5 or something like that. But it's mint. I mean, the projection on it is just incredible. It just sounds so full, you know? Beauty. And... Uh, for me, it's got nice separation between the notes. The bass notes stick out. Everything just seems to be nicely balanced. I noticed with my Takemine, and actually some people commented on it, they said that uh, the bass notes were a little bit lost. And you know what? When I listen back to the videos, I, I'm inclined to agree that the Takemine, in quite a few of my performances, the bass was, was quite hard to hear. Yeah, and it wasn't the recording or anything. It's just the way the guitar is. But this is nice and punchy. I love it. Yeah, nice and grunty. Hmm. 
Yeah, Chris, I think it is, eh? There's so many cool guitars out there to choose from and so many different woods. Yeah, back in the day, it was spruce, cedar, and Brazilian rosewood, as far as classical guitars were concerned. That was like a re the recipe, if you will. And uh, I guess since uh, Brazilian rosewood has been put on the endangered list, um, luthiers, guitar makers have had to be a bit more resourceful and experiment with other woods that are, um, you know, aren't restricted or illegal or anything like that. And so we've got a, you know, probably guitars made from wood that a hundred years ago, guitar makers would, wouldn't have even contemplated using those woods. And now you've got Hawaiian core, Indian rosewood, uh, was it Chocobolo? Oh, all sorts. Yeah, mahogany. Like, who was it up there that said their guitars uh, largely made from mahogany? Uh, I remember when mahogany was really just restricted to the neck, and that was about it. Yeah, so it's nice to see all these exotic woods, and some of them just look wow. You know, I see some classical guitars. I'd buy them just on the way they look. You know, not even the way they sound. Just some of them just look so amazing that, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd buy heaps if I could. But this guitar, that you know, the grain on it's beautiful. Don't know if you can see it there, but it's pretty even. And I, I love this feature. Yeah, it's really, really nice. Stands out a lot. And, yeah, it's nice to see something a bit different at the back. Usually the back of a guitar is so boring. It's just a big piece of wood, you know, book-matched uh, halves or whatever they call it. Um, but, yeah, when it's got these sort of features and that it's, it's really nice. It makes it sort of more aesthetically pleasing, I guess, to look at. That's just me. Some people might not like that sort of stuff, but but I do. Doctor. Hi, man. You know what? I just love hearing that people have learned some stuff from me. It's amazing. Uh, back when I started the channel, I didn't even know if anyone would even bother uh, to watch any of my videos. It's true, man. I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a go, and I don't care. I'm just going to get my stuff out there, and I'm going to try to teach some classical guitar and let's see where it takes me. And, you know, now I've got people like like all of you that have turned up today, and it's just so rewarding. Yeah, it's so rewarding. Yeah, Chris, man, you sound like a knowledgeable dude. Yeah. Yep, different woods have different tonal differences. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in guitars like these, eh? classical guitars and acoustic guitars. It's you know, I think it's really important. Yeah, along with the bracing, uh, I had a chance. I don't know if any of you have, have seen my video where I play a Matthias Demand guitar. Uh, it got heaps of views because I gave it a bit of a catchy title too. You know, I said it was sixty thousand US dollars or something like that. And uh, I played that guitar in Hong Kong when I was living in China. I went to Hong Kong and uh, I bought myself a, a uh, BAM guitar case. I needed a really good guitar case uh, to send my Takamine back to New Zealand. So I went there and I didn't realize they had all these amazing guitars in the shop. And uh, I asked if I could play one. And yeah, they let me play the Matthias Demand. And that was a double top. First time I'd ever played a double top. And that thing was working. <clears throat> yeah, I still wouldn't have bought it though, even if I had 60 grand. Um, it was mean, but it just wasn't me. I, I couldn't really, I didn't really gel with that instrument. Engineer, Chris. Oh, yep, that explains it. Yeah, it was 60,000, 60,000 US. It was made in 1994. And, uh, that's, I don't know, that guitar could be worth way more than that now. I think it was one of the very first of his guitars that were a double top. And that, that's one of the reasons why it had such a big price on it. And I think also some people from Hong Kong that are subscribed to the channel actually have told me that Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, prices get jacked up quite a lot. I guess maybe because there's heaps of... Uh, fairly wealthy people there. I'm not quite sure, but that's what they were telling me anyway. Oh, 
you've got a lettuce double top. Whoa, man, you've got heaps. Oh, yeah, that's what else I wanted to discuss. That's right, man, my memory. Who watched the GFA finals or preliminary rounds or all of that stuff? The guitar, guitar, in case you don't know what GFA is, it's the Guitar Foundation of America. They have a competition. So they have youth, which is 14 and under. And then I think they have like, it's, I don't think it's called young adult, but it's in between. So then it's 14 to 17 or 18. And then senior competition, I think, for adults uh, over eight, over the age of 18. If you haven't checked it out, well worth checking out the videos. They're all on YouTube. Yeah, so uh, some incredible guitar players, of course. Yeah, agreed, Chris. Hong Kong is pricey, as is Singapore. Oh, did you watch it, Chris? Did you watch the GFA? I really thought... I thought Mateusz Kowalski was going to take it out. Like, he's my guy. I thought he was going to going to win that competition, not Lovro, but, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. It is subjective. But I just thought, I don't know, man, something about Mateusz, the way he plays, it's just, it sounds a bit cliche, even coming from me, you know, from a guitarist, because usually it's non-guitarists that say stuff like stuff like this, but... It does seem like he was just born with that guitar in his hands. If you haven't, if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about a Polish guitarist called uh, Mateusz Kowalski. I think that's how you say his name. And he is just, he's something else. He just, oh, he just flies around the guitar. It's like, there's no different, no separation between him and his guitar. It's just uh, quite a sight and sound to behold. So, yeah, check him out, Mateusz Kowalski. Incredible. I think he should have won the GFA 2022. But that's just my opinion. And I guess music shouldn't be a competition anyway. But some of those competitions are pretty handy. They get people, they get them noticed, and also they win some pretty cool prizes. I don't actually, I th well, actually, I, th I think the prize for the seniors is a tour. Um, a nationwide tour of America, I think, and probably some coin, maybe even a guitar. And as they get younger and younger, it's sort of cash prizes and strings and cool stuff. Yeah, so if you've just joined the channel, uh, just joined the live stream, I should say, let me know where you're from, let me know your name and the guitar you're playing. Yeah, so I started learning a new piece this morning. Uh, what's everyone out there learning? I'm still into learning studies and stuff. quite a quite impressive Chris that you've got all those other mean sounding guitars and you keep coming back to the Cordoba yeah amazing ah Cavatina what a piece that was my father's favorite piece <laughs> It's 
something like that. Um, that's as, as far as I can remember. Hey, good day, Robert. Yeah, this is a C12. Yeah, Cordoba C12. So you're not far off. Pretty close. Hey, thanks, not so easy. Man, I crack up at some of the names I see here. Streets of Rage. Not so easy. Yeah, so where are you guys from? Yes, yeah, so I've been working on this, eh? This, uh, this etude. I really like it. I didn't realize how cool it was. C.E. and a Cordoba Orchestra. Uh, mm, excuse my ignorance. Is a C5 C.E. Is that a cutaway electric? Is that also a Cordoba? I'm a med, I guess the C.E. means cutaway electric. Ooh, what's a, what's a Cordoba Orchestra? Do tell, do tell. Oh, another India, eh? Cool, cool. Not so easy. Oh, you learned the first two measures of Bore. You know that Bore, it's one of the... It's probably one of the coolest early pieces I heard for classical guitar. Uh, before I went to boarding school, oh, well, I wasn't listening to classical music. I barely knew what it was. I just thought it was stuffy guys in penguin suits <laughs> playing instruments I'd never even seen in real life. Uh, yeah, but when I went off to boarding school and I got exposed to all this different type of music and I don't know, I just gravitated towards classical music after that. And uh, yeah, Bore, man, I don't know. I think I think uh, maybe I heard Ingve Malmsteen playing it for something, just mucking around. And I thought, what is that? And my guitar teacher at the time happened to be learning it, so he, he taught me as well. Well, let's face it, uh, it's all about pick a destiny, isn't it? Can't you see he's the man? Oh, I can't remember. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Getting a bit rusty. It's such a good piece, though. You only learn the first two measures, though. What about the rest? Cool. 
crossover the neck is not as so crossover is that like it's half classical and half acoustic the neck is not as wide and the size is close to a parlor guitar oh yeah 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 sounds comfortable Oh, it takes a little bit, you know, to get the timing and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, like rhythm, rhythm can be challenging, definitely. Uh, but if you, the thing with with Bore, it's an it's an example of counterpoint. So you got two lines going, usually in opposite directions, and you hear it right from the beginning. So you've got G in the bass, and an E as the melody. And you've got, you know, so as the as the melody's going up, the bass is going down. Uh, that's a compositional form or technique known as contrary motion. Contrary, you know, one's going up, one's going down, one's going north, one's going south. So. Um, yeah, for the beret, uh, if you're struggling with the timing, make sure you can play the melody at least in time. If you can't just if you can't do the melody in time how can you possibly put the whole thing together yeah a lot of people um mistakenly when they when when a, let me rephrase this let me start again when people are embarking on their journey on the guitar or musical instruments especially one like a an instrument where you can play more than one note at one time they try to chew the whole thing you know, so they hear the piece and it's got so many notes going on and they're like, yeah, man, I'm going to learn this whole thing. But it's like it's like trying to eat a whole pie in one bite. You know, it, that's the equivalent of grabbing this giant pie and going, Ugh! and trying to eat the whole thing. It, you're just going to get overwhelmed. So my suggestion is if you're struggling with the timing of something, make sure you can identify where the melody is and at least get to learn the melody. So let's look at Bore. So with Bore, you can see what, if you know anything about music theory, you'll see that Bach is, is going between the harmonic minor and melodic minor. So that's got that very kind of harmonic-y minor feel. You know, with the uh, the raise the sharp seven there. And because he's ascending, he's using the melodic mind. So he's got uh, five, six, seven, eight. But when he goes down, he's flattening them, which is usually what you do in the melodic um, in the melodic scale. You uh, raise the sixth and seventh on if you're ascending, and then when you're descending. You flatten them. So raised, raised. But then he because he's descending, flat seven, flat six. There's a little bit of theory for you, you know, melodic scales in it and how they're used, the melodic minor. When it's ascending, it's flat three, raise six, raise seven. And when it's descending, it's flat seven, flat six, flat three. The flat three is there. That's why it's called the melodic minor, because the flattened third is always there, whether you're ascending or descending. It's this kind of thing. It's the melodic minor. And then when you descend, so you descend in the pure minor, and you 
ascend in the melodic minor. Yeah, so just, uh, yeah, I didn't really intend this to turn into a lesson, but it's all good. So yeah, if, and then you start putting things together. So you might look at the bass then of Bore. the bass. Yeah. And then bring it together. Uh, it's a bit like when people are trying to learn to sing and play the guitar at the same time. Like, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. Can you sing it? And they can't even sing the words. Do you know the chords? And they can't even play the chords. You know, so make sure you get one sorted. Learn how to sing the song. Make sure that's sorted. Learn how to play the chords and then bring it all together. So if you're learning something, a piece of contrapuntal music like Bore, um, and you're struggling with the timing, I would suggest breaking it down into melody and bass and then slowly put the two together. Anyway, I'm um, getting a bit behind with the comments. Uh, if you don't know note names, man, just learn some theory, bro. You know? Yeah, it goes hand in hand. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. You can be an incredible musician and not read a note. Not read one note of music. Um, but it doesn't matter. Uh but if you want to go into classical music, like classical guitar and stuff, it's pretty important. Uh, yeah, because it's it's kind of complex. There's a lot going on. You know, like if you're learning a solo by, I don't know, Marty Friedman or Jason Becker or Yngwie Malmsteen, usually it's just one note at a time. And you can, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's easy to identify, but it's easier to pick one note going, you know, one successive note after another, then it is to hear multiple notes all at the same time. For example, like this. Multiple notes going on. And to, to try to learn that from tab or just by ear, is, it's a challenge. To, yeah. So you could have your work cut out for you to try to learn that if you can't read music. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm sure there's some deadly people out there that will just listen to it and, oh, yeah, no, I know all the notes. But for most people, <clears throat> it would be a real struggle to learn that by ear. So, yeah, unless, uh, you know, you subscribe to someone like me that teaches every single note, um, yeah, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a hard journey. So if, if you're really serious about getting good on the classical guitar, I would suggest that you learn some music theory and at least learn where the notes are on your guitar. Next step would be reading music. Chicken picking. I don't teach chicken picking. <laughs> well, do I? Yeah, Robert. 
Yeah. Uh, I think apparently Paco de Lucia couldn't read music. I don't know. You know, it's all anecdotal. But uh, he played the concerto de Anjuez. Uh, and I heard he learned it by ear. And I don't know. See, that's the thing. I don't know if that's true or not. But if it is true, wow. <clears throat> that is a crazy thing to do by ear. Uh, but, you know, Paco de Luthia, special person. Yeah, giant. <clears throat> I think I've got that. Oh, yeah, I have. I don't know if you guys can see that Concierto de Haranjuez. I've been working on this for about 100 years and I still can't play it. I think I need 200 years. Oh, Lindsay Buckingham. Yeah, Fleetwood Mac. Choice guitar player. Yeah, especially in the classical realm, eh, Robert? The greats read music, of course, um, and they're usually extremely well-versed in theory. You should listen to John Williams talking to some of his students. You can tell that dude wasn't just a beast on the guitar. He, oh, a beast. I, I shouldn't speak of him in the past tense. Uh, it's also, his, his theoretical knowledge is also right up there. Uh, yeah. Majority of us is playing for family or self as a pleasure, which is fine. Yeah, I think you know, I've been doing YouTube for six years. I could say four seriously because the last two have been, uh, yeah, not the best as far as me uploading content. Uh, but prior to that, uh, I, I read so thousands and thousands of comments and from what I could gather, most people that are subscribed to the channel are uh, just playing guitar for their own pleasure. And as you said, Robert, uh, playing for family, close friends or something like that. And yeah, if, uh, I sort of designed, oh, I didn't design, uh, I mean, I, my vision for this channel was to bring the classical, bring some of the greatest pieces of the classical guitar repertoire into the hands of those that cannot read music or that can but just 
can't really get that onto the guitar. You know, there, there's so many challenges when you think about it, like becoming a, a great musician. And uh, I'll elaborate. I mean, a great musician that can also read music because uh, reading music itself is uh, it's mastering another language. And it's a weird one. Little dots and lines and words. You know, uh, that in itself is a challenge. And not only do you have to read that, but then you've got the arduous task of trying to get that onto an instrument and make some type of coherent, uh, audibly appealing uh, interpretation of it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, musicians uh, got a, they've got a lot to take care of when they're um, when they're on their journey as a musician. So yeah, it's a it's a real challenge uh, to reach that level. I think where you can read music and you can bring it uh, out from the instrument. And yeah, so when I started the channel. Uh, my idea was to put these pieces into the hands of those that maybe had the technical facility to play the pieces, but could just could just couldn't work them out uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they can't read music, or their music reading wasn't up to that level. But their fingers could could do everything if they were just shown where to do it or where to put the fingers. Um, and also to get the classical guitar into regions where there's no classical guitar teachers. Uh, if you're in the US or if you're fortunate enough to live in uh, you know, Western Europe or Eastern Europe or you know, sort of first world countries like New Zealand, Australia, you know, parts of Europe, most of Europe, I would say, you know, Canada, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. There's a good chance there's a classical guitar player near you <clears throat> and you can learn you can get some lessons but there are many places in the world nah <laughs> there's no classical guitar teachers of note um yeah so I, I was hoping that i could get out to those people as well when i started the channel oh you're welcome chris man like i said earlier in the stream i love it i love teaching uh, yeah, I get a great joy. And actually something that I've come to really enjoy about YouTube is that I can teach something once and video it and it's there forever uh, for people to enjoy. And if they've got any questions, they can always come back and ask ask me about it or ask somebody else. It, it's just been wonderful. Uh, I'm so glad that YouTube came along, really. Uh, back when I started teaching, which is a long time ago, um, there wasn't really anything like YouTube. Well, the internet wasn't even around. That's how old I am. Um, but I saw the value in it fairly early on. It just took me a while to get started on YouTube. Um, you know how life is. Sometimes you've got other stuff to do. But I always thought it would be a great medium uh, to teach on and share. And, uh, yeah, it's been life-changing for me. Excuse me, just having some water. We actually never learn to hear multiple notes, but there the theory comes in. Yeah, once again, that's something that that has gradually introduced the ability to hear more than one note at a time, uh, because it's it's doable. Um, we hear we do it all the time. We're actually born into a world where we are making or trying to make sense of hundreds of different sounds all at the same time and your body subconsciously registers them all you know it knows when the kettle's boiling i uh, can hear the fire going the wind uh, the creaking of your house your guitar playing the tv all sorts of things you're you're taking it all in uh, all the time but uh, music when you're learning to to try to get uh to learn by ear you just Go back to what I was saying before about Bore, for example. You just learn to identify single parts first. Because if you can't do that, you don't have any hope of getting any further. You you won't be able to figure out even the most simple of chords. You'll be challenged uh, all the time. It's better to start off just learning one note at a time and identifying, oh, yeah, that's a melody. Hmm, can I whistle that? Or can I kind of play it on my guitar? 
And you will find that you will get bitter and bitter and bitter at it. And gradually you'll be able to hear, discern two notes at the same time. And then three, and then four, five. And you can even get to a point where you can, you just know progressions, chord, certain chord progressions. I, I can, I don't even need my guitar with me sometimes and I can hear, oh yeah, that's a major seventh chord, oh yeah, minor seven. Okay, it's a one, four, five. You know, oh, there's a sixth thrown in there. And oh, it's, you know, the dominant five, something like that. I, I don't even need my guitar. And I can hear that. Um, it's a lot of it's just because I've heard them so many times before. Yeah, and I've got many years of musical experience behind me. So, uh, yeah, just remember music is like a journey. You know, it's not a destination, there's no real destination there. You're just learning and keep yourself happy, all that sort of thing. Oh, Ting, sorry, man, I missed you. Uh, gee, how do you say your last name? Ting X Y O O J. Whoa. If you're still there, spell it out phonetically for us, man. Oh, uh, yeah. So what sort of technical challenges is everybody facing out there? Yeah, success, that's one of those interesting uh, words, eh? I think, yeah, probably there's a lot of pressure to be successful, <laughs> whatever that is, you know, whatever that means. I think to everybody it, it means different things, eh? <clears throat> different levels of success, all that. Hey there, Juan. Uh, yes, it does. So it's got them on the fifth, seventh, and ninth frets. Very handy too, I must say. I kind of don't know how dudes can perform without them. Oh, my, my Takamine TH5C doesn't have them, and it's a pain in the butt, so I just used to use some twink. You know, dab a bit of twink at the top. <laughs> Not ideal, but it worked. <clears throat> oh, 
Ivan, g'day, man. So yeah, if you if you just popped in, uh, let me know your name, where you're from, and what guitar you're playing. Can I demonstrate an exercise I enjoy doing that gives me the greatest overall benefit for warm ups? Ooh. <laughs> Good question. Uh, I really like doing this one. Um, on all the strings. Yeah, so I really like doing that one. That gets the, the blood pumping and uh, like a hammer pull off combo as well. And uh, for the right hand warm ups, all I really do is just run scales. And I usually just do one octave. Or something maybe and then backwards. Oh. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Just gentle, gentle warm ups, nothing too ferocious. The idea is to just warm up, you know, not give yourself a hernia or uh, break your finger or something like that. And I, I like doing just the A major scale actually for warm ups with the little dotted rhythms. That's quite nice for warm up. If you wanted to do some chord stuff, uh, just some simple Giuliani. That sort of stuff. Does that help, Ivan? The, just those sorts of... I really like that one. Uh, every now and again, I'll, I'll do this one. Uh, these are all on the channel too, by the way, if you're wondering what they are. Those sorts of exercises, really handy. Yeah, and then you can stretch out a bit further. That sort of stuff. That's nice warm ups. Houston, Texas. Oh, another person from Texas. Cordoba and Yamaha. Man, you know what? I can't believe this. It's like so many people in the so many people watching have Cordoba guitars. Why do I feel like I'm the last guy to the party? Yeah, amazing. And Yamaha too. That's the uh, second or third time I've seen Yamaha come up in the chat. Mean. Oh, good one, Ivan. Yeah, I'm glad you like that. Have you watched the uh, the lessons of Carvicho Arabe that I did with Andre De Vitas? you got to watch those, man. Like, Andre, he took me to another level. You know, you, you get to this level where, you like, you can play all the notes, 
you can play them all and it's all good. But then there's a way of making it just another level. You know, when you hear some people play it, like, well, I play those notes, the exact same ones, but <laughs> they just sound way better. Or not better, maybe uh, convincing, you know, musically convincing. Uh, as classical guitarists know, uh, we have to do quite a lot with the guitar to make it not monotonous. You know, for example, uh, I'll see what I can remember of Capriccio Arabe. So imagine if I play this just really square like this. Okay, so that's cool. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. Nice. But then... that which is you know totally different or I could go for a sweeter tone It's that musical thing, and um, I think Andreas was. So when Andreas was was uh, talking about Capiccia uh he said I was putting too much emphasis on the um, on the I don't know how to describe those notes on the in between notes. So the, the melody is. But I, uh, I was putting too much emphasis on these in-between notes. Like, everything sounded the same volume. So he, he said, just play the melody notes loud and pull the others back like this. Before I butcher it any worse. Uh, yeah, so well worth checking out the lesson that I did with Andre uh, for Capriccio Arabe. Sorry. Really, really, uh, I mean, listen to the difference, eh? Listen to this. nothing wrong with it all good i'm hitting all the right notes however it's not that musical is it uh, it's just like i'm just thumping away So 
it, it sort of goes with what I was talking about before with Bore, is identifying the melody and pulling everything else back. Uh, it's like a mix. If any of you have ever done any mixing, you don't really have everything at the same level. Uh, if you did, it's going to sound a bit weird. Uh, imagine if the drums and the vocals and the piano and the guitars and everything is all at the same volume and all straight down the middle of the mix. It's just going to sound cluttered and a bit bizarre. And so uh, the challenge on classical guitar is to try to do everything and mix everything well with your fingers. So you don't want too much bass all the time. You know, you don't want too much of the, the chords, like the rhythm. So you can imagine that you, Capiccio Arabe is being sung. So th this is the, the lovely uh, female singer, Contralto. So that's what she's singing. Um, and then you've got the, so you got the bass. And in between, you've got like the rhythm guitarist or the pianist just going ping, ching, so. So we're, we're giving that the singer the front of the mix or the most prominent position in the mix. And we're pushing everything else back. So the next, the next most prominent uh, voice is the bass. with something hopefully very very musical I digress. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit carried away with myself there, but uh, that's one way to breathe more musicality into your piece. Uh, it's not to just thump away at the strings all the time, you know, bang, bang, bang. emptying concert halls if you played like that yeah and, and even just normal people would be like hmm, something's not quite right there uh, yeah so it's something to really consider when you're playing uh how and which notes are you emphasizing at which times yeah um and it's not always that the high notes are the ones to you know like melodies are sometimes hidden um a lot of Bach's music, everything's kind of hidden, especially some of his fugues.
can hear a lot going on in there. Um, so sometimes it's just a matter of identifying where the melody is or where the piece is moving and how it's moving. Uh, it may be that sometimes the bass line is taking you in a direction. It's not the melody per se, but for a moment it shines and uh, you have to give it its, its due importance. Let's take a look at uh, Sonatina Meridional. Uh, where are we in it? is shifting to the bass and you need to use the bass line to show everybody where this particular passage or musical idea is going uh, so where was I there so let's take it from here so there these other notes are not that important It's really not. It's and then it shifts to the bass. So, it's so that that C sharp. That's what you want to be emphasizing there. So you, it's a bit of a swap. So we've come from. And then we've got. together so th there you're just holding that chord and then the bass line takes over so there's like a whole lot of call and responses uh, that's actually been uh, that's a constant sort of musical idea Uh, 
know, let me see what else is going on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I get, I got a bit carried away there. Uh, Stockton, California. You've got a Cordoba, Ivan. Man, I, I reckon it could be like seventy percent of people that have come to this stream have got a Cordoba. Wow, mean. Uh, Cordoba GK Studio. Does that mean is it a plug-in? Is it a electric as well? Juan Houston. Cool, cool. Oh man, Ivan, I'm glad you saw those videos. Yeah, choice. Andreas, man, work at player. Oh, not so easy. So, what are you a luthier? Hey, Simon, what? You got the same guitar, bro. Yeah. That's cool, man. Do you like it? I love this one. Whoa, Ivan, did you just send me 10 bucks, man? If you did, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't even know you could do that. Oh. Actually, I think I did know, but I don't think anyone's has they has anyone ever donated before. Wow, man, thank you, eh? I really appreciate that. Yeah, so let's have a look at that piece. I guess I, I probably got. I think I've got about another twenty minutes before I have to sign out and go and take care of some other stuff. Thank 
Kidu, how do I say your name, man? Navaldo Souza. Brazil. Hey, man, thanks for the hugs. Hugs from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Oh, Kenza. Hey, wasn't it you? Didn't you win the lesson? I think you were the first guy to comment on this video, weren't you? Not in the live chat, but um, on the video itself. Was it? I think it was. Yeah, so um, Kenza, if it was you, hit, hit me up MBN Guitar on Facebook or MBN Guitar Instagram. Yeah, and uh, we can work it out regarding the Skype lesson. If it was you, I'm pretty sure it was you. Yeah, so just in case anybody didn't know, I was running a wee bit of a competition. Uh, just if anybody could name the guitar. Uh, uh, name this guitar, that is. If you don't, those of you that don't know, I, this is one of my, I just bought this about six weeks ago. If you follow me on social media, if you follow NBN Guitar on Facebook or Instagram, you would have seen this. You would have known about six weeks ago that I bought a new guitar. Um, yeah, so if you want to keep in touch with what I'm up to, that's what that, that's a fairly good way. I'm usually posting some funny stuff on Facebook and Instagram pretty regularly. Uh, but yeah, um, if it was you, Kenza, uh, Keith, Keith, oh, yeah, was it? Did you say that someone beat you to it? And that they could take the lesson? Was that you? I'll have to have a look back through it. Anyway, the winner or winners, contact me through Facebook or Instagram, NBN Guitar. That's the best way. And then we can jack up a Skype lesson. <clears throat> yeah, all good. That'll be cool. Oh. <clears throat> Let me see. Oh, I see, Keith. Yeah, um, so I think the problem is it's not a problem, really. It's my fault. <clears throat> but uh, I announced this on a post first, I think. It was a post, and... Oh, no, it looks like I'm going to have to give away about three lessons, I think. <laughs> uh, that's what you get for being disorganized, I suppose. But all good. Yeah, Keith. Uh, yeah, man. 
you can never listen from me, sweet ears. Just uh, like I said, reach out to me via MB and Guitar on Facebook or Instagram, and we'll jack something up. Sweet. Ooh, music from Brazil. Very nice. Got a request for some music from Brazil. So it's got to be the one and only HBL, right? Said a complete mind blank then. Thank you. 
Oh, sorry, mate. A little bit rusty on that one. There's some little pieces, little little bits I just can't quite remember. Yeah, Kenza, man, just hit me up. Hit me up on Facebook or uh, Instagram, MBN Guitar. We'll go from there. Well, <clears throat> people, it, it, it's time for me to go. I've been streaming for about two hours now. But I must say it's been an absolute joy for me. To, I can't believe how quickly two hours just goes, especially for me. Uh, it's been wonderful chatting to everybody and I, I just can't believe the you know the level of support that I still have even though I'm kind of absent from the channel thanks for sharing all the info to everyone out there that told me what their guitars are where they live and what they're up to very very cool <clears throat> uh yeah so so that's me everybody <clears throat> um have a good one and as you know let your fingers fly I'm out <clears throat>